Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar, Operating in Your 2022 New Normal, Shaping and Influencing Culture in a Remote Work Environment, brought to you by the IABC Heritage Region. I'm Heather Onorati, Communications Specialist for the Region. Here's just a little background on the International Association of Business Communicators. IABC serves professionals who work in internal and external communication, as well as public relations and related disciplines throughout the world. We also have programs for students. Our heritage region encompasses 17 states in Washington, DC. As you can see, IABC offers a range of opportunities to learn, give back, and forge meaningful professional relationships. Today, our presenter, Leslie Crone, will share ways to positively influence culture in the evolving workplace as you execute on clear and measurable communication objectives during 2022 and beyond. Leslie Crone is Chief Communications Officer and Senior Director of Communications and Public Affairs Division at Argonne. In her role, Leslie ensures that all audiences, internal and external, understand the lab's mission and how their science changes the world. Prior to joining Argonne in 2018, Leslie held leadership roles in communications and marketing at Nielsen, Sarah Lee, GE, and Accenture. She holds a master's in integrated marketing communication from Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism and a bachelor's degree in American studies from the University of Notre Dame. She is an exceptional presenter with experience at the IABC Heritage Region Virtual Conference and the IABC World Conference. Before we begin, we have a couple of housekeeping notes. I'd like to introduce Amy Miller, IABC Heritage Region Tech Associate for this webinar. Amy will review a few quick points to help you gain the most from this experience. Hi, everyone. During the presentation, if you'd like to send us a question for discussion, please use the chat feature anytime. To help you think about possible questions, right now we're showing some thoughts that may spur ideas for you. Also, today's webinar is being recorded. As a registered attendee, you will receive the following. A link to our very brief survey as you leave the webinar. Please take a moment to respond so we can keep making improvements. And you'll also get an email with links to today's presentation PDF, a recording of the session, the survey in case you missed it on your way out of today's webinar, and a synopsis of the questions and answers from today's session. And now we'll turn it over to Leslie to get started. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Heather. I am delighted to be here this, well, it's this afternoon, I think officially everywhere in Chicago and around the East Coast. Um, I, uh, I am looking at the list of attendees and I'm delighted we've got so many folks here. It's gonna make this kind of fun. And some shout outs to some of my old colleagues. I see your names in the chat, Emily and Rob. Uh, thanks for joining. So. Um, without further ado, uh, Gina, why don't you go ahead and click through to the next slide. So one of the things that I'm going to embed into this session is some interactivity. And we use a service called Poll Everywhere. Some of you may or may not be um, familiar with it, but I invite you to grab your phone. There it is, my phone. Um, and send a text message where you type in the phone number, type in 22333, and where you would type in the, hey, how you doing part of your message, type in Argon one and you should receive a text message back that says you're in the meeting. And then we're gonna conduct a couple of polls uh, just to gauge where everybody on the uh, uh, webinar is relative to remote work and culture building and things of that nature. There is also an option if you um, don't have your phone handy, you can go to a browser and type in pollev.com forward slash argon one and that'll get you to the exact same place. So I'll give you a minute to do that. Um, and we're gonna start out with our first question. So I got my phone ready to go. Gina, go ahead. And the instructions are still up there at the top of the uh, slide. So what I'm interested in finding out right at the very beginning of this uh, talk here is what percentage of your workforce is currently teleworking? And all you need to type in is a letter, A, B, C, or D. You don't want to type in a number. And this chart is going to build in front of our eyes. <laughs> and we're going to see how we compare to uh, some data that I've got out in the marketplace here. So let's see, we are at this. Here we go. Give that a second to build. Okay. 
All right, so it's pretty clear the vast, vast, vast majority of uh, the organizations that you are uh, representing and with are still in a pretty significant maximum telework capacity. That number is well over 75%. So um, that's a good benchmark for us. Um, if I'd have asked this question six months ago, we might have had a different percentage, but this is where we are now. All right, Gina, go ahead to the next question, please. And the next question, what I'm interested in knowing is whether you expect that number to increase or decrease or stay the same in the, uh, in the next six months. Because what this gets at is how many organizations are planning to bring people back to the way it used to be, uh, how many people are going to uh, learn from what they've done and maintain some sort of teleworking, uh, a hybrid culture, right? So it seems to have stabilized a little bit here. Very few are going to increase. That's not much of a surprise. Um, and the decreases in the stay in the same are running pretty neck and neck. So, but a little edge to the decrease. So uh, what this says to me is that most of the organizations are going to continue some level of remote work. So why don't we go to the third polling question. Now, this one's a little different. What we're looking for here is one word. And if you need two words, please put a hyphen between them. Otherwise, the software will disconnect them, right? But I'm looking for one word that you would suggest is a benefit that your organization would gain if you embrace a hybrid workplace. So throw in one word or a a hyphenated word. And as you can see, it's building a word cloud for us. All right, so what do I see in here? I see obviously a lot of flexibility. Um, <clears throat> employees have gotten used to the flexibility and given the job market right now are starting to man demand more flexibility, I, I believe, than they ever had before. That enables people to get balance, right? We got the word retention in there, staff retention in there, uh, obviously competitive job market. Also see some other things in here that definitely talk about employee satisfaction, wellness, happiness, inclusivity, inclusivity happier employees, right? So a, a lot of things that organizations and employees gain from being able to embrace and, and work well within a hybrid workplace. Okay, so let's go to the next slide um, and uh, wanna tell you what we're gonna talk about today. So there's five things that I'm gonna cover uh, in the span of the next half hour or so. Uh, these are the things that I think are key to doing this well, right? Shaping culture when you have some portion, significant portion of your employees working remotely or in the office some days and out of the office other days, right? So the first thing is you need to know what the culture is that you want to have. And there's as many different kinds of cultures as there are organizations, but knowing what you want it to be is the first step. The second piece, um, which I think, you know, it all falls off the rails, if you have not aligned your key leaders to a set of key messages that build that culture of, of what you've decided you want it to be. The third thing, um, the hybrid workplace depends on digital, depends on um, all manner of technology, and uh, certainly the communications depends on a variety of uh, technology, uh, digital platforms, and things of that nature. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I also know that when uh, you're getting bombarded with you know, hundreds of emails a day and messaging from you know all over the place, cutting through the clutter and being creative is as relevant as it was you know 100 years ago. Um, and, and so we'll talk a little bit about that and I'll give you some examples. Um, and then the last piece I think to succeeding here is really building in mechanisms to listen, uh, to be able to respond, to measure success, to know where you are in the grand scheme of things. So those are the five things that we're gonna talk about. So if we go to the next slide, um, what you'll see on this chart harkens back to the very first polling question um, that I asked, which is what percentage of your organization is currently working remotely? And our number was a little north of 75%, but the data from Pew showed 71. So we're pretty much in line, right? But if you ask the question, what percentage of people want to continue working from home post pandemic? That number is about 54. Um, I've been tracking this for over a year. It's hovered right at that 54, 55% mark for a long time. So this isn't changing a lot. It's not going away. And if you take a look at where we were before the pandemic, the number was only 20% of people were working from home. So it is really a significant shift moving from 20 
to 54 on a long-term sustainable basis. So that is the reason I think we are all here. We know it's time. The data shows us we've got a big lift ahead of us. As communicators, we're right in the middle of it. Go ahead, Gina, to the next slide. So the, the next uh, section of the presentation is really an Argonne case study, right? So I'm gonna kind of walk you through where we were at the beginning of this and, and how we are uh, working these issues, the five things that I talked about, just to give you an example of how it can be done and how it's been successful for us, um, for sure. Go ahead, Gina. So the thing that's interesting about Argonne is if you compare the chart we just looked at with 20% of the people working remotely, Argonne was decidedly different. Um, Argonne's a national laboratory. I'll talk about that in a second. We only had 3% of our workforce remote, and we went immediately to 90-something percent, and we've settled in at about 66% right now. Uh, yet we have that exact same percentage, 54%, who want to continue working from home. So for, for, for my organization, it was a huge shift to get from our pre-pandemic teleworking uh, status to our current one. And we still have to adjust to this 54% uh, go forward new normal, if you will. The next slide shows you a few things about Argonne National Laboratory. I'm guessing that most of you may not be familiar with it. Um, we're a workplace of about 3,000, uh, 3,400 employees uh, just outside of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we are funded primarily by the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, we do research and development on almost any kind of scientific and technical topic you can think of, from artificial intelligence to nuclear um, reactor development, the incredible wide range of, of research uh, that happens at the laboratory. So our workforce, and this is important to know as well, about half of them are scientific and engineers, right? So they are a lot of logical mathematical um, people, you know, and, and they're very rigorous in their thinking. And so when you talk about messaging into an audience, you need to know that the big half of our workforce is scientific and technical. Um, the other half of the workforce are people like me or my colleagues in HR or B, um, uh, IT, uh, finance, right? The, the corporate functions that support the base business, which is the R&D. Uh, the other thing that makes Argonne very unique uh, before the pandemic, and it came to a screeching halt during the pandemic, is we used to have 8,000 visiting researchers coming in to use our facilities. And uh, that made it a virtual revolving door on a global basis of cultures, of languages, of ethnicity, of diversity. Uh, and so that's the environment that all of these communications I'm going to describe are going into. Um, we are one of 17 national laboratories. Uh, we celebrated our 75th anniversary last year. Um, we were born out of the Manhattan Project and the science that'll come up again in a, in a few minutes later on. And my boss, I may refer to him because I just tend to, his name is Paul Kearns. He is the laboratory director, but he, he is the equivalent of any CEO in an other organization. All right, so that's a little bit about Argonne. On the next slide, what you're gonna see is, uh, what our culture is, right? So I said it is really important to understand what your culture is so that you can build it, so that you can reinforce it, so that you can course correct to it. So uh, about three years ago, we rolled out a set of core values. Um, we were a little behind the curve on that one. Most organizations that I have worked with previously have had core values for 20 years. Argonne, it was new to us. Um, so rolling these out was really critical to articulating what we expected of our people and how they interacted with each other. I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, <clears throat> impact was the most important thing, right? We are doing things for a purpose. We are changing the world with our science. Uh, and the things that we do bear dividends on people's lives, people's health, on the planet, on industrial competitiveness for decades in the future. So impact is huge. Uh, safety uh, as a scientific entity where we're dealing with uh, hazardous chemicals and radiological materials, uh, safety has to be the first thing that we think about. Uh, respect was something that's an interesting topic at the laboratory because um, the scientific, medical, engineering cultures can tend to be sometimes disrespectful. And, and we actually joined an organization called the, um, the National, well, the National Association of Science and um, Engineering Medicine had done a study on sexual harassment and Argonne kind of joined that saying we are going to take actions to try and uh, prevent sexual harassment in our in our discipline. So there's a lot of work we're doing around respect, um, integrity, teamwork, um, things that I think are important to almost every uh, organization. But anyway, we defined our culture. We said this is what we want to do. This is how it's important to our mission. Uh, 
So we're going to come back to core values in a minute too. So go ahead. Next slide, please. So it's one thing to know what you want your culture to be. And we had that defined pre-pandemic. So we had that going for us. But then what we did was we got hit like everybody else with what I call these tsunamis of change uh, uh, that just kept coming at us, right? So the first one was go from 3% teleworking to 90% teleworking in a week. And I know many of you experienced that. Um, one of the things that came out of that immediately was a very specific challenge for uh, caregivers, particularly people with small children, non-reading children, uh, you know, and as school went virtual, you know, that just became a very important topic uh, within our workforce. Um, uh, we uh, managed through uh, the uh, George Floyd murder, all of the social unrest. Our people, uh, I think, as everywhere, were exceedingly troubled uh, by that and wanted to know what the organization stood for and what actions they were going to take uh, organizationally and personally, right? So we had to work through that. As an entity funded by the federal government, uh, the uh, presidential election um, in 2020, right, was non-trivial for us. Uh, and it came with a, a change at every level of our support uh, in the White House and in the Department of Energy. So we had to manage through that. Um, there have been, uh, again, change after change after change around testing for COVID and how often to test and what kind of tests and making tests available and, and getting our employees into surveillance screening programs. And then the last thing, you know, as we noticed uh, around variants and, and vaccination, and I'll talk about vaccination specifically in a second, you know, but I can tell you this, that between March of 2020 and December of 2021, so the first 21 months of the pandemic, we had about 400 cases at the laboratory total. Between the Christmas holidays and today, we have had 300, right? So the Omicron variant was just, again, like I'm saying, tidal waves, tsunamis of change that the laboratory is trying to figure out how to manage through. So uh, go ahead, one more click there, Gina, for us. So when you have all that change and churn in, in the work, uh, it's really important, and I said, to align key leaders to key messages. So I'm going to tell you how we did this. And a lot of people look at this and say, oh, my goodness, how did you do it? We did it. It's discipline. There's nothing other than discipline. Every day at the beginning of the pandemic, and now we're meeting three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, six key people on the leadership team get together. Paul, my laboratory director, his chief operating officer, the chief scientist at the laboratory, the chief of staff the deputy director for operations and the head of communications. We get on the phone for half an hour, three times a week, and we talk about what's going on, what decisions need to be made, you know, what needs to move, et cetera. Um, daily at 3.30, and again, my team is trying to match, mirror this cadence. So 3.30 in the afternoon, I get together with 15 of my communications leadership people. And I say, here's what I heard. Here's the actions in front of us. We, we keep tabs on every deliverable that we have created and need to create and how it's flowing through approvals and all those kinds of things. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 40 people on the operations leadership team met. Those are the folks in IT, HR, facilities, safety, et cetera. Again, we're aligning these key players. When we put up signage at the laboratory, we have 100 buildings. We need everybody in the building facilities team helping us you know, update our signage about how much distance we need and whether you can wear a mask or not wear a mask and put your mask back on. Right, like a lot of change and churn. And then every other Tuesday at nine o'clock, the CEO, his direct reports and their direct reports, which is about 70 people, what I call the extended leadership team, would get together. And again, we would pass along the information. We would tell them what they needed to know. We would give them talking points for big changes. So that alignment of key messages and key leaders just took discipline. It took calendaring. Um, it's, it's been absolutely a key to our success. Go ahead. So I think one of the things when you're talking about building culture in high times of high uncertainty and lots of change, you gotta hang your head on truth and transparency. That's the only way you're gonna be able to build trust. So we created new communications channels to do that. I'll start with the one on the right-hand side of the slide because this is the most visited page uh, on our intranet and has been since the day we started it, which was the first August uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and this is a list of every positive case at the laboratory. It's sanitized, so you can't identify individuals, but you can tell whether it was in your building or somebody else's building and whether or not uh, the contact tracing was finished and you know 
those kinds of things. Um, this page continues to be uh, the number one page that is hit. And you can see as of you know, January 13, 640 cases, we're already over 750. So uh, incredible. On the left-hand side of the page, you'll see something that we created that we call the COVID weekly update. And uh, it's obviously a lot of information. So that top part of this little newsletter that goes out to everybody uh, just says, here's what you need to know. Cases are up, community transmission is up, take your mask off, put your mask on, whatever it is, we need people to know it's in that first section. The next chart shows uh, the waves of cases at the laboratory broken out by um, folks who were on site when they were infectious, which makes people very nervous, and people who were not. So that's the difference between the blue and the orange bars, and then you can sort of see the trend line. Um, but that is something people have come to rely on. It's like, if I don't pay attention to everything else, because they've got a lot going on, they read this. And then lastly, we created an info hub, you know, for all of our COVID resources on our intranet, you know, where you can see all kinds of past um, memos, uh, reference documents, et cetera. So we created a bunch of channels. We were very transparent with all of the data uh, and were able to use all of those things to build trust, trust with the workforce. Go ahead. All right, so I said I was gonna talk about the vaccine mandate. Um, you know, a lot of organizations struggled with the decision about whether they could or they should or they wanted to uh, mandate or require vaccines for their workforce. And without going into that debate, I'll just say that at the laboratory, leadership decided they wanted to make it a requirement as a condition of employment, right? So that means that everybody who is paid by Argon uh, has to either get vaccinated or file a request for a, a religious or a medical exemption. And as you can imagine, it was extraordinarily controversial, right? So when I thought about like, again, how are we gonna build and sustain this culture, right? We had to equip our leaders with the tools they needed to have the conversations with their employees, right? And so there were countless talking points in some forums. We had two, um, well, that gets to the listening bullet in the middle, right? We had um, two sessions, Q and A sessions, where literally we just put our senior executives on the firing line. So you see a picture of them up in that top middle box there. You see Paul Kearns, my boss, the head of research, the head of operations, myself as the moderator, safety, HR, medical, and legal. And all we did was take questions from people who challenged the necessity of it, the legality of it, the you know health uh, implications of it, et cetera. But making ourselves available to listen to their concerns was really, really key. Um, we did get through it, you know, we lost out of 3000 people, we lost three who, who literally said they would rather quit and, and lose their job than get a vaccine. And we were, um, I think we thought it would be a lot higher than that. We thought it might be a hundred or 200. And it, in the end it was three, but handled again with trust, with compassion. And then we said, coming out of it, we gotta kind of rebuild morale here, right? So we definitely had our eye on the ball of this, our, our workforce is taking a hit here, like they, didn't like it, right? Even the ones who agreed to do it didn't like it, right? So um, we, we put a lot of extra effort into boosting morale. And so on the lower left, you see something that we call meet me in the virtual cafeteria. That was just a place uh, and an, uh, a venue where people could get together and kind of reconnect after this thing. We also did a virtual open mic, um, which is a great big hit for us. We did that in December around the holidays. But at, to get through this vaccine mandate, you needed to you know, equip the leaders, you needed to listen, you had to give people a chance to vent, and then you had to kind of pick up the pieces and, and kind of move past it. So that was our story on the vaccine mandate. Go ahead, let's... Uh... So I said I was gonna talk about embracing digital and, and, and maintaining engagement. So the next couple of slides are, are how we did that. Go ahead, Gina, to the next one. Um, so this is a series of, of different things that we did from a communications perspective that tried to address all of the things that I've described. So, you know, we created an app, we had an app, but we put a lot of COVID features on it, right? A daily self-check and a, you know, how to report a case of COVID. And we added COVID things to our, our, our Argon app. Um, we created a, a whole new Teams channel. If you're familiar with Microsoft Teams, we use that uh, called Argon Connects. And that was just a way for people to share um, their, their thoughts on caregiving. We had a caregiving channel, for instance, I mentioned that. And you see the caregiving conversation, the digital poster we did for one of the conversations that we had there. Uh, we created something we called Minute in the Clinic. In the lower left, you see our, our chief medical officer and she spends um, 
you know, a minute and a half to two minutes on a video. And we have now posted, we hit a hundred um, of things from, you know, when is it safe for me to get a booster after I've had COVID to, you know, what's going on with ivermectin, right? Like she answered medical questions related to COVID all through this. Um, the Unite, Adapt, and Lead in the middle is a theme that came out of all of our communications work. And uh, starting in about May, uh, right after the pandemic started, we said, we got to mobilize, we've got to inspire and motivate people to get through this. So Unite, Adapt, and Lead was our theme. And you're going to see that come up in a minute. So go ahead. Um, the next thing I think is the video that I have here, which I include because we had to get people to wear masks. And I know you guys all face that challenge too. So we tried to do that with a bit of humor. So I'm going to turn my camera off so you can watch the video here. Um, I think that video helps get to the next piece of the uh, uh, advice right around being creative, right? That video, uh, everybody loved, it made it clear, but it, it did it in a funny, humorous way. That ruler, the six foot ruler, um, we made that as a prop for this video. But what actually ended up happening is everybody wanted one. And so for a holiday gift for my peers, I had a set of those made for the 70 people who were on that extended leadership team. And I sent it to all of them. And they started putting it in their offices. I had it in my home office for a long time. And you would just start seeing that ruler everywhere. And it was a quick visual reminder of, I got to keep my distance, right? So cutting through the clutter, an important thing to get your message across. So one of the things that we did again, to build culture, to build camaraderie, to connect people who were all very far away, was we did something we called a, we got it covered contest, right? So we we're trying to reinforce what we called the three W's, which are wash your hands, watch your distance and wear a mask, right? Three W's. Um, but by getting our leadership team involved and again, in a humorous way. So on the left-hand side, you see a, a little composition that we did of the Argonne Bunch, but those are our you know, CFOs on there, the head of HR is on there, head of IT is on there. Uh, head of safety. And it, they're just allowing themselves, they're putting themselves out there in a humorous way to say, hey, you know, we all have to, you know, put our face coverings on. The one on the right uh, was a cover, right, of uh, the Abbey Road cover, right? So that my lab director is second from the left and the uh, COO is the uh, second from the right, the two in the middle. And you see the yellow ruler off in the distance, right? The man on the, and the man in the distance, right? It was a way for, again, the leadership to poke a little fun at things, but make a point, right? We got somebody carrying hand sanitizer, right? So we created these two things as examples of covers, right? And then we said, hey, employees, show us your covers. Show us how you want to, you know, uh, communicate all of these safety messages, right? So on the next page, what you see are the things that came back to us from our employees. So you've got a riff on American Gothic and on Nighthawks. 
Um, you have socially distanced friends, and those are members of my creative services team, actually, including Madison, who did all the work on the deck here. Uh, shout out to Madison. Um, and, but on the right hand side, HEW is our health and employee wellness center. So these are the folks that have been on the front line of COVID all the time. And, you know, that was how they tried to communicate, uh, you know, the, the safety expectations we have. And you see the hand sanitizer and you see the ruler and things like that. So it, it really got the entire laboratory engaged and um, in, in a really fun way. And, and, and the winners were determined by employee votes, right? So there was a upvoting of, of favorites. Uh, so really an engaging creative kind of campaign. But the, the bottom line, we wanted people to understand what the safety standards was. Okay, next slide shows uh, something different. Um, you know, one of the things the laboratory has done since the beginning of the pandemic is we are absolutely in the mix on the research around the virus. Uh, so uh, we have helped uh, map the protein structure on the spike protein that you've heard about. And that is critical information to help figure out what things will bind to it or how to you know, stop things from binding to it. Uh, we've done infographics that talk about how individual cases progress, right? We have big, big instrumentation. We tested masks and different uh, varieties of masks. Um, we have done a lot of modeling of the spread of the pandemic. Um, so the uh, supercomputers that we have have been very valuable in that. You know, so the communications team isn't all just doing internal communications. We're also trying to, you know, share out with the world the impact Argonne is having, again, on big global issues uh, and challenges like COVID. You know, so we, we created and you can see, you know, got pick up and coverage in a lot of Chicago areas, but in national and international things as well. Um, the net result of all that, it pays double dividends, if you will, because the uh, not only are we sharing what we are doing, you know, and building the reputation of the laboratory, but it builds pride in our employee community. So it's really important that we make them aware of all the research that we're doing, and we've been sharing that out internally as well. On the next slide, um, just to give you a sense of scale and scope, um, I had Annette on my team. Um, uh, we have kept track, as I mentioned, on my daily call with my team, we have a line item for every deliverable that we create, whether it's a presentation or an open mic night, and I'll answer the question about what that is in a second, um, or a fact sheet or the signage that we do or a memo from the lab director. We've kept track of that since the beginning of the pandemic, over 1,100 individual de deliverables. I mentioned the press effort, 5,100 media placements, um, 65 countries, um, huge reach. Uh, the events team, 460 virtual events. Those are internal and external. Um, and then you can see kind of the numbers of signs and posts and things on our internal channels. It is a lot of effort. Um, this crisis communications uh, has been just a lot of work for my team. Uh, and I imagine it is for yours as well. Uh, go ahead. So the last thing I want to kind of cover here is this notion about listening and responding. Um, it's really important, I think, to understand the mindset of the workforce. And uh, you can do that anecdotally, individually, and organizationally. So here are some of the things that we did. Um, we've done a variety of listening sessions. I mentioned the one on the vaccine mandate. Um, we did one on caregiving. Uh, we've done them on a variety of topics. Um, the lab director, Paul, does uh, once or twice a month listening sessions that we call conversations with Kearns. They used to be in person, and now we pivoted to digital. But he sits and listens to employees every week or two, or every two or three weeks. Um, we have big employee surveys. We um, uh, leverage uh, that give us information on uh, the mindset of the workforce. Uh, one of the things that we created specifically for COVID and the pandemic was something we called a temperature check. And we send that out. Um, we took our workforce, we divided it into four cohorts, if you will. And every two weeks, we send to one cohort. So we're not taking everybody's temperature every two weeks, but we are taking the temperature of the organization every two weeks. And we have now got data from that for over a year. Uh, and it's uh, something where we can vary the questions, uh, invaluable information uh, on how people are feeling about pre-vaccines. We said, how likely are you to get a vaccine? So we had a sense. And then we monitored, have you gotten a vaccine? And we could monitor that stuff too. 
um, but we've asked questions. We have proximity sensors, little uh, devices that people wear. And when you come within six feet of somebody, it buzzes and it flashes the lights. And again, trying to get the pulse of the organization in terms of how receptive to are they to those types of interventions and management techniques, things like that. Um, our employee resource team has been working overtime on this. We set up both a 24-hour COVID hotline and a uh, an email box, and those ants those get answered within 24 hours. All right. Um, I'm going to wrap up uh, so we can get to some questions. The next slide really, um, you know, to remind everybody these five things, right? This is what I think is really important to doing this well. You got to know what your culture, what you want it to be. And right when that vaccine mandate came along and we knew we took a hit, we had to course correct to get us back on that path. Uh, lining up key messages and key leaders. I, I did see a question in the chat. I'll answer that one really quickly. You know, do we still need to meet every day? I would tell you generally now the answer is, well, the answer right now is yes. And it's because we are getting ready to reopen the lab and that's a major shift and change. And so we are meeting every day. Um, but for the months, you know, July through December, the leaders were meeting three times a week. My communications team met one or three times a week, depending on the need. Uh, the, the extended leadership team sustained their every two week cadence. So we did modify the, the, the sequencing and the timing of that, but um, consistency was key. Um, talked a lot about digital. I'm going to show you another video in a second. Um, think, try to demonstrate how creativity really does help get through, get your message across in a memorable way. And then a variety of techniques to make sure that you are measuring your success, that you're listening and you're able to respond to needs um, such as we did with caregiving, right? So. Um, the next click will take us into a video, so I'll turn my camera off. We created this video in May of 2020, so pretty soon after the pandemic. And remember, I talked about Unite, Adapt, and Lead as our, our, our mantra to help motivate and get the workforce through this. And of course, in May, we had no idea how long this was going to go along. Uh, go on. But uh, tried to link it back to our heritage, tried to link it to our culture and our core values. So Gina, go ahead. Take a look at the video. Rarely in modern history has a group of scientists from all over the world raced against time to impact society. Our founding father, Enrico Fermi, was part of one such group in the 1940s. Today, every moment counts in the fight against the novel coronavirus, which represents one of the greatest challenges of our lifetimes. Argon is in the fight. Argon scientists are working around the clock to better understand the virus and minimize its impact. We are contributing to the advancement and development of antivirals and vaccines, utilizing supercomputing and artificial intelligence. We are unlocking the secrets of the virus's protein structures, providing information that accelerates research at universities and companies. We are working with other national labs across the country to investigate better ways of manufacturing much-needed supplies of masks, ventilators, and testing equipment. We are providing models that help the government predict the spread of the virus to inform future public health decisions. More than 75 years after Fermi's contribution changed the world, the scientific community is making history again. Whether at the lab or at home, Argonne has chosen to unite and adapt. Our contribution is making an impact. Every one of us has a role to play. As a society, we will conquer COVID-19 and move on to the next grand scientific challenge. Together. Together. So, um... I just love that video and I, you know, the ending of it with the Zoom screen, right, was something that uh, just kind of hit us, but I love the ending of that. All right, um, so my last poll question here, um, I always find it interesting to kind of check before we start Q&A, you know, kind of what's the one thing that stands out to you? Um, you don't need to restrict yourself to one word. Um, when the responses come in on this, they'll scroll kind of like movie credits, so you'll be able to read them. You know, but I'm always interested to hear, you know, what resonates the most? What are you going to take away from the session? And we'll let those scroll for uh, 30 seconds or so. I don't know how many of you would agree that I feel like the pandemic has elevated communications in the eyes of leadership in a way that 
uh, just I've never seen before. Um, so I think the organization really understands how important and valuable communications can be. Somebody had asked a question uh, about how many people I have on an internal comms team. Um, I have five. Um, my total team is um, probably about 60 people, including videographers and photographers in-house, which I understand is an absolute luxury. Um, we make the most of them. They you know, do great, great work. Trust and transparency, can't say it enough. I, I will tell you, uh, as the lead communicator at the laboratory, there were times I had to be reminded that we needed to be transparent because as the communicator, I see risk. <laughs> and, uh, and so we had to have some conversations with leadership about the pros and the cons and what level of transparency and things of that nature. So. All right, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I think I'm gonna, uh, I think Gina will capture all these. So when you get your follow on materials, you'll see all the thoughts here. If you haven't seen your scroll past, um, but we're gonna go into Q and A. So Gina, I think if you click again, we're gonna move on to uh, turn it back over to Heather and she'll facilitate the Q and A. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was so much great information. Um, if anyone has questions for Leslie, you can go ahead and add them to the chat. And I'm going to go ahead and start reading the questions that came in during the presentation. Um, we had quite a few come in regarding, um, you know, building trust and transparency. Um, what advice do you have for organizations that are 100% remote? Well, I mean, trust and transparency is different, right? You can do that in person or remote. It's different from the uh, the remote question. So I'm going to take trust and transparency first. Um, like I said, there's a tension there. Uh, and it's natural and it's healthy, right? And sometimes you need legal opinions and, and things like that. Uh, but I would say, you know, people want to know. If you don't tell them, they will make it up and you lose control of your message. So erring as much on the side of truth and transparency as you can do is is what you want to shoot for and when you have to dial it back and, and keep something hold something back you need to have a really good reason for it um uh, but i think that you know getting to truth and transparency is is just essential especially in times of crisis and i look at the pandemic as one big really really long crisis i would say the same thing of deep water horizon or any other kind of uh, high profile executive eg exits for malfeasance and things of that nature, you know, truth and transparency uh, that won't land you in jail, uh, you know, is what you want to shoot for. You will not always get there, but you need to strive for it, right? So challenge yourself, allow yourself to be challenged, get as much information out there as you can. Next question. Thank you. Oh, wait, 100% um, remote. Um, somebody, you, you mentioned, how do you manage with 100% yeah. remote? In some ways, that's easier because everybody's remote. Uh, the hardest part I feel like is when you have people in, in an office and people home and we've tried that. And, and the feedback on that type of interaction, whether it's a meeting or whatever, is really challenging because it's very hard to connect with which other group you're not in. Um, uh, so I think with, if you're in 100 you know, percent remote, uh, you don't have to worry about leaving people out or forgetting them, they're all remote. Uh, you know, so I would just go back to the main precepts. You're going to have to leverage digital, 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 right? Um, and in a communications plan, you may have to up your reliance on, on on digital channels, things, you know, that maybe you didn't have before you need to budget for secure, right? Like our Teams channel became a very important connectivity tool um, and uh, teaching people how to use it becomes important. Um, driving people to it, the We've Got It Covered contest drove people to the Teams channel to do the voting, right? So all of those things were working uh, in concert together, but yeah, um, I kind of well, wish I had 100% remote. I think it'd be easier. Go ahead. Yeah. And Well, to that point, somebody just asked, uh, have you gotten a sense of which mode of communication has been most successful for you? Email newsletters, intranet, MS Teams? Um. Well, I think you guys probably would all have the same opinion on email, right? You know, what percentage of your emails are read? We clock it. We know exactly how many people read our emails. And I'm astounded at the 50% of people who don't think they need to read the email from the CEO. I'm like, really? Not important? Um, but, you know, our, our um, we know what our pickup is on emails from leadership, from newsletters. Uh, we can see which pages they hit. 
um, what we make sure we do is that if people aren't getting the message via one channel, we try and reinforce it another without making that channel irrelevant, right? So um, if we constantly double up our messaging everywhere, then you, you know, you're just making a lot of work. Uh, we really do try to stick to um, specific channels, but the director's message, for instance, will go out via email and we will post it as the you know top story on our internet. So we make sure we are picking up people who might hit the internet but not read the email. Like I said, 50% of the people don't read the email, right? They got so many emails coming in. Okay. Um, and so could, this is back to the beginning of your presentation where you were talking about the Argonne workplace shift. And you mentioned that 54% of people, the, the question is, is it the 54% um, tracking the people who want to only work remotely or want to work hybrid? I think it's a combination of both. Okay. Both. Okay. And then when, uh, let's see, when you're discussing the leadership alignment, why do you need to meet? Oh, you, I'm sorry. You answered that question earlier. Um, building a virtual community. What um, on your slide about your um, ideas there or your actions that you did, um, what was the virtual open mic? A few people wanted to know. Oh, yeah. So um, we did several of these. We did one in May, right after the pandemic began. And we literally said, you know, we're going to take a, a lunch break, 12 o'clock on a Friday. We're going to do a standard open mic. So you could um, send in and say, hey, I would like to play my guitar. I'm going to sing a song. I'm going to recite a poem. I'm going to share some of my photography. Right. We just let people express whatever they wanted to as a break. And it was a it was a big success. Um, and so at the holidays last year, um, we just not the most recent ones, the ones before that, we did a holiday version, and we had um, invited people to engage their families. So we had one of our HR reps and her two small children doing the hippopotamus Christmas song with like, little hats, and it was hilarious, <laughs> right? Um, my lab director, right, this, this guy, I got to give him a lot of credit because he gives me latitude and he gives me support. And so when we were doing the open mic night, he's like, well, I kind of want to participate, but I really don't have any talent. <laughs> and I said, can you mix a drink, Paul? He's like, yeah, I can mix a drink. I said, do a mixology lesson, you know, two minutes. He did how to make a Yule mule. And he put on this little apron and he got a buddy to help him because he wanted some moral support. And the, between the two aprons and these two guys in two different places, mixing a Yule Mule, that's the way people learn to laugh at themselves. And the lab director puts himself out there. But those are the kinds of things we did in the open mic. I did a riff on Baby It's Cold Outside. We rewrote the words and called it Baby It's COVID Outside. And that thing, you know, I, I wish I had time to show that. This is super fun, right? Uh, so just ways to get people excited, engaged, take a break from, you know, all the challenges and stress of, of the uh, pandemic. We call it the open mic night, even nice. though it was in the day. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, okay, so we have also a couple of people and I think, you know, this sort of goes to, you know, now we have a lot of people working behind the scenes and sometimes people feel like they can be a little bit more cranky when they're, you know, not upfront face to face. So there was a couple of people that wanted to know about, you know, if you're fully remote, how can internal communications help with alleviating rude behavior with, you know, team members who are stressed and, you know, feeling. Yep. yep. So I would say that's not an internal comms solution, right? The solution to bad behavior anywhere is, is supervision management and leadership. And it has to do with how much of that's tolerated. And I'll go back to what I was talking about in terms of the core values at the laboratory and respect. Um, there are, when I arrived at the laboratory four years ago, stories and tales of rude people were rampant. And, you know, people that were yelling in the hallways or dressing down people in meetings, whatever the, you know, scenario was. And um, that's why respect became so important in our core values. And it had to do with leadership standing up, the lab director saying, this will not stand, not on my watch. Internal comms is never going to get you out of that. It is a management issue. And management has to ex accept the reality that it exists. And they have to lay down the law that says it won't be tolerated. And the hardest part is following through when you see somebody who is disrespectful. And um, it's, it's a management supervision issue. It's not an internal comms issue. Uh, internal comms should and can flag it and they can be part of the solution. But I would tell you, there's no way internal comms will ever solve that problem alone. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so onboarding, um, organizations who are onboarding uh, employees who are remote or hybrid, any advice on that and, um, you know, kind of getting them into the culture, you know, while you're trying to onboard them? Yep. So the laboratory between March of 2020 and maybe I think the number was September of last year had hired 400 people who had never set foot at the laboratory. And now we've probably up to 500 or something like that. Um, so we pivoted very quickly to online interviews. Uh, we pivoted to virtual tours of, of workspaces and facilities. If you're a researcher, you wanna see what's my lab look like, right? So we made use of, again, embrace technology, put on your you know, iPhone and your body cam, your go cam, whatever, your GoPro and show people things in a virtual way. So we did all that to get people in the door. Once they were in the door, we had a we used to have a two half day orientation session that was converted to all digital. Um, for my team in particular, I made sure that everybody who came in had a buddy, somebody who knew the place. Um, I hired a woman who's uh, leading events for my team. And before the pandemic, we used to have a lot of events. VIPs would come through. You know, we used to, we had presidents and secretary of energy and governors and big VIP kind of visits and. Um, she came in in November, a year ago, and in May, uh, Gina McCarthy, who's a climate advisor to the White House, said she wanted to come to the laboratory, and she wanted, you know, to stop at this building and that building and this other building, and the head of events said, I don't know where those buildings are, and so, you know, the team rallied around her and, you know, came into the laboratory and took her on a tour, and, you know, so we, we onboarded um, at point of need as well as generally, right, uh, based on skills and, and things that were needed, so, um, I think it, it really helps to plan that out um, and the cultural aspects, you just have to engage them and you have to explain, you know, what they are and things like that. So um, we've created an onboarding checklist, you know, an onboarding plan, everything from how do you hook up their phone and get them a computer remotely, right? Are we shipping it to you or are you come to the lab to pick it up, right? A lot of those details. Um, we just codified what we were doing once we figured out how to do it well. Took, okay. took a good six months. Wow. Well, okay, so what about virtual, um, internal virtual communications, like for people who might want to visit, but from various locations, do you have any experience with, you know, kind of virtual tours to? Um, yeah, well, we had a very significant visit program, both for the public and for school groups and, and things like that. Um, so we did convert all that uh, to, to virtual. Um, some of the facilities, you know, 20% of the facilities that we have get 80% of the traffic. So we made sure we prioritize creating virtual experiences. You know, it's essentially a big long video that kind of goes through the space. And some of them have narration embedded in the video and some of them don't so that an individual can talk while the video is moving through. So we were able to do those kinds of things. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Okay. Um, well, here's a question, I guess, maybe sort of similar. And it's in a man in a manufacturing environment, remote isn't really an option. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any ideas from uh, like about whether how to build culture when you feel some of the messing do messaging doesn't include you? Like, oh, so yeah. how to target I, those people? <laughs> I see that from Julie. Hello, Julie. Um, our, our environment is essentially very similar to a manufacturing environment. Like I said, we have labs. We have supercomputers. There are people in there working hardware. There are people in there, the custodians. Like There are people at the lab all the time. 33% of the lab is there. So we are always worrying about including both types of workers, right? Um, and so I'll give you an example. Um, it was important to me when I got here that the laboratory director had a channel to get his most important messages out we created something we called a quarterly all hands meeting, right? Um, very traditional internal comms tactic. And um, we typically, before the pandemic, people would meet at the lab in our big conference spaces, our big auditoriums, right? Um, and we didn't really, we did the live stream, right? But most people went in person. When we went remote, we had to convert that meeting to be virtual. And then all of a sudden, the people who were left out, quote unquote, were the ones who were on site because we didn't have an on site component to that meeting anymore. So we got smarter as we you know, learned, and the remote folks were saying, I don't know, or not the remote folks, the on site people were like, Where do I watch it now? You know, I can't go to the auditorium, you're not there. 
And so we have a series of digital um, screens, flat screens all around the campus. And it took us a while to figure out how can we stream the Zoom to those TVs where the people who were on campus could gather around those screens or they could turn it on in a conference room and watch it together. Um, so I think you really do have to be mindful all the time about what your channel is and how the different workers remote or on site are able to plug into it. It takes a lot of thought and a lot of effort. Um, and the messaging, you know, to the point about messaging, uh, you have to specify sometimes, right? You know, for those of you who are on site, you need to do X, Y, Z. And for those of you who are remote, you need to upload it this way, right? The on-site people can drop it off in this mailbox. The remote people have to upload it to this digital box, right? So I think you just have to constantly be thinking about the needs of those different groups on site and not. Sure. Okay. Um, how about to keeping your finger on the pulse? What measures do you use to track culture? Um, well, uh, you know, the uh, temperature check that we do, we've got four questions that we ask every single time of every group. You know, one is um, Argonne's number one priority is my safety and health, right? And so we've watched, you know, the levels to which people agree and, and disagree with that. We ask a question about whether people are um, up, up to date on our COVID precautions, safety requirements and precautions. And so we can see whether people kind of feel like, yes, they understand what they're supposed to do or they're, they're falling off. So there are specific questions that we ask all the time to keep our, our, our finger on that and measure that. Um, I can also measure it um, based on uh, the traffic to big important announcements that we make, um, whether that's like the lab's gonna reopen or um, the lab's going to shut down. I can I can see all that. And then we have something that we call a climate survey, which is really more like an employee engagement survey, but we only do it every three years. So it's not really very helpful relative to the pandemic, but it is helpful over time, understanding um, people's affinity, whether their trust in leadership, for instance, their trust in their supervisor, other aspects of culture. So we do do that. Um, we did one in 2015, 17, and 2020. Um, we did one in the middle of the pandemic. So uh, interesting, uh, but you got to have the tools and some of them yeah. are invest, you know, investments, but you need them. Yeah, I have one more. I'm, I'm, we have like two more minutes to wrap up, but I wanted to see if I could squeeze this one in. Um, and this person is wondering, you know, they're new to their function, the senior manager, not getting, this was regarding your building or when you were talking about with the sitting with the C-suite. Um, they wanted to know how do they, is there any advice for somebody at uh, this person's level? What are the steps I need to take to align leaders when I'm not invited to the cocktail party yet? They're not getting, you know, they're getting filtered messaging, not getting direct access to the meetings and, and the messaging. Well, I think that's probably a frank conversation with the supervisor to figure out whether the supervisor is advocating for that or not. And if they are, right, um, you know, asking how can I be helpful in that effort, right? Would you like me to give you a list of, of issues where, you know, we're either hearing the information late or, you know, to build a case, right, for why you, you, you want access and um, a seat at the table. Uh, right. If the supervisor isn't advocating for it or doesn't see the need, I think you have a bigger issue, frankly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Leslie. That was a okay. lot of great information. We covered a lot of ground there. Um, and I think that's all the time we have for the questions today. So I'm going to hand it over to Amy to wrap it up for our attendees today. And thank you all for your questions and your participation in the polls. I really enjoyed it. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. We want to make sure you're aware of just a few quick notes as we part company today. If you have further questions for Leslie, you can contact her at the email address shown on the slide. Please do complete the participant survey. It will open when you exit the webinar. Watch your email for details on our upcoming Heritage Region webinars, which will focus on volunteer positions available, how to prepare an entry for Silver Quill, and the benefits of submitting for Silver Quill, as well as certification opportunities. If you would like to present a future webinar, please email the IABC Heritage Region using the contact information on the slide. And you can learn more about IABC membership benefits at iabc.com slash membership. Thank you again for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon.